Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world today. My name is Louise Thorpe and I'm Vice President for Client Experience for Blackboard in Europe, Middle East and Africa and I'll be your moderator for this session. Welcome everyone and please feel free to add where you are joining from in the chat. Also, welcome to our speaker Matthew Deprose. Matt is Senior Learning Designer at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom. For the last 20 years he has developed and managed the institution's LMS from a pilot to a mission critical service. Matt is often found posting on the community site, on the mailing list, presenting at the Blackboard European Teaching and Learning Conferences, tweeting, blogging and sharing on YouTube. And I will add his various links in the chat in a moment. If you have any questions during the session, please add them to the chat or to the Q&A and we will try to address as many as we can at the end of the session. Matt's presentation today is the Practical Bluffers Guide to Blackboard Theme Accessibility. Brace yourself everyone. Matt, over to you. Hello everyone and thank you Louise for a fantastic introduction. This is the Practical Bluffers Guide to Blackboard Theme Accessibility. My name is Matthew Deeprose and I'm the Senior Learning Designer at the University of Southampton. So a quick exercise to start with. What number do you see here? Maybe write it in the chat or uh, just think about it. But what number do you see here? So if you see the number 74, then you might well have normal color vision, but this is only one test. If you see the number 21, you may have red green color vision deficiency, which is one of the most form common forms of color blindness. And did you know that more than 300 million people worldwide have color blindness and many more report difficulties with their sight. And as we grow older, our ability to see color decreases. So with that in mind, imagine if your blackboard looked like this or like this. So those colors were from our institutional color palette, but just because we're on brand there doesn't mean we should be using those color combinations because hopefully you could tell they had some quite poor contrast between each other. So when we introduced the responsive theme at the University of Southampton, we wanted to make sure that it was both on brand, so using our institutional colors, and also aligned with accessibility guidelines. And based on my experiences of doing that, this presentation is the Practical Bluffers Guide to Blackboard Theme Accessibility. Now, a quick poll. Has your theme on your Blackboard been customized? So if you have a custom theme, uh, say yes. And if you don't believe your theme has been customized, say no. And if you're not sure, then uh, just leave it. And we're just going to keep it open just for a few more moments. And then we're going to look at the results. So looking at the results, 71% uh, had had their theme customized, 28% had not. So we're in a good place to hopefully meet everyone's expectations of this session. And you may well have seen other Bluffers guides uh, around that I've been posting on the community site. We started last year in the uh, European Teaching and Learning Conference with a, a guide to customizing the theme. That was four stages, taking you from Bluffer to Innovator. At the European Blackboard Conference a few months ago, I gave a similar presentation which uh, covered accessibility considerations, but that was more from the point of view of recent EU and European, uh, UK and European regulations. And this presentation is a more practical look at theme accessibility with lots of help to get you started. So by the end of this presentation, you will know about the web accessibility guidelines that relate to theme customization and ways that we can use these guidelines when we are customizing our theme. In terms of what's in scope, we're looking at the Blackboard original experience and out of scope is Blackboard Ultra or materials uploaded to Blackboard by staff or students. Although you should find a lot of the material that I cover of interest regardless. Everything that I'm referring to today is on my conference support website where you can find all of the resources for this presentation and also all of the other presentations that I've given lately at Blackboard conferences. Who am I? As I said, I'm Matthew Deeprose. And as Louise said, I've been managing Blackboard at Southampton University since July 2000, so almost 20 years now. I was a Blackboard Most Valuable Player 
and now I'm a member of the Blackboard Community Leadership Circle. And I've given a number of presentations and I recommend taking a look at that link that's at the bottom of every slide where you can access those. And I particularly give a shout out to my presentation, Better Blackboard Help, which if you're on the original experience, I think you would find that very interesting. And as Louise mentioned, I've got lots of uh, links and so on. I'm on Twitter, on the community site, and you're very welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you're thinking Southampton, never heard of it. It is at the uh, south coast of the UK. Uh, so there you can see where it is on the map. And if you do have questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A boxes. Louise will wrap them up for me and we'll go through any that we have time for at the end. But I do have almost 150 slides, so it might well be that your question is answered a bit later on. If you're thinking, Matt, I don't know anything about customizing the theme. I don't even know how to get started. Well, I'd say you're in luck because our presentation from last year, uh, here's a picture. It's, um, it was Sam Cole, who's now at Falmouth University, over there on the left, Esther Munoz from eLearning Media uh, in between us, and myself on the right. Now, Esther, you probably will have known from the community site, Esther is pretty much the god of theme customization. She's taught Sam and I a lot and gave this presentation with us. And I'm gonna show you a two and a half minute clip of that presentation to show you that it is worth taking a look at and you really will be able to learn how to start customizing your theme. So let's take a look at that. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? While you enjoy your lunch today, we're going to give you a presentation. Bluffer's Guide to Customizing the 2016 Blackboard Theme. So why are we giving this talk? So customizing the 2016 theme is probably the most popular topic on the Blackboard community site right now. So that we can show you four steps to take you from a bluffer to an innovator, including top tips from experts in their field from around the community site. And uh, by the end of this talk, you should feel confident at having a go at customizing the and these are some examples of my clients that have decided I, I work for one of the partners so I, I handle many many blackboard learns and I've been doing modifications and personalizations for our clients so these are some of our clients that have kindly agreed to allow me to show this one so this is University of Seville and um, they wanted to have that logo there and the big picture on the back which has uh, a gray shadow on top which is built in two layers the logo is in the third layer with that Enseñanza Virtual uh, text and then the tabs in two different colors. Also the modules have been modified to have a little bit bigger text as a, as a title and I think they look really, really clean somehow. And we found that the, the quickest, easiest way to start finding stuff out was using this Inspect Element tool. So Inspect Element is just um, an option in most browsers where you can look at the HTML and the CSS uh, and it works better, best if you've got two monitors where you can have um, on one screen you can have your web page on the other screen you can have your inspect element and you'll get this at first this slightly confusing looking screen with lots of uh, code on it but the key bit is that you can really then start to pick out individual elements on that web page to see what the associated CSS is and again using the example that Matt used earlier about changing a color you can start just dragging that color around to see how that affects the specific element that you're working with. So not only do we have that resource to help you, but um, there's much more help that I'm sharing today. On the Blackboard community site, I've released the full source code and the whole theme zip file uh, for you to use and customize as you see fit. And using the techniques that I'll show you today, and also in the presentation from last year, you're really going to be able to get started quickly. And now I'm going to prove it. We're going to look at a one and a half minute video where I demonstrate using the theme that I've put on the community site, along with a tool called Stylus, recommended by a number of colleagues on the Blackboard community, so we can see how you can use what I'm sharing to get started quickly with your own customizations. Let's take a look. In this short clip, I'll demonstrate how to preview the theme I have shared without having to install it. Here is my post on the Blackboard community site. As well as sharing the files, I've made it easy to access the CSS source code 
from within the post. Having selected it all, I right click and choose Copy. On the left, I have a Blackboard environment running the default theme. As you can see, all the default interface colors and styles are present. On the right, I have the browser plugin, Stylus. I paste in all the CSS code from my blog post and then tick Enabled. Immediately, you can see how Blackboard looks with this theme applied. I may experiment with sections of the code to verify what they do. As well as changing simple things like colors, I can adjust all the other settings and add new ones. This is very powerful for prototyping and demonstrating potential changes without having to implement them. Okay, so for many institutions or for many staff and students, the only way to engage with their institution lately has been through the internet because of the COVID lockdown. And therefore, I believe that it is even more vital that the learning management system is as accessible as possible. And it's not just me saying that. I'm sure you may well have seen a number of articles recently about the importance of digital accessibility during this period of COVID-19 lockdown. And um, you might also think, Matt, I don't have any disabled students. But I would reply by saying, well, impairments may not only be permanent, we also have temporary and situational impairments. And this graphic from Microsoft Design shows that well. And if you look at the top right, uh, the, the new parent, I imagine that many of you may, during this lockdown period, have been trying to work on the computer with one hand and dealing with a child, a pet, a partner or something else with the other. A few more quotes uh, that I'd like to show, share with you. A website isn't usable unless it is accessible. And also that we'll benefit from accessible features at different points in our lives. So you might think, Matt, is there any guidance about web accessibility to kind of help me know what to do? And I'd say, yes, there are the web content accessibility guidelines developed by the World Wide Web Consortium. Now, these have been going on since uh, 1999. When they were introduced, there are 14 guidelines, including some of the things that we might already know quite well, such as um, providing alternate text when we're unable to see uh, a graphic. In 2008, they were updated and they introduced a concept called PAW, which is an acronym that was used to structure the guidelines. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. They're also designed to be applicable for not just the web, but also for documents and software. And they introduced three levels of conformance that I'll tell you about in a moment. A couple of years ago, uh, and 10 years since the last update, there was a big update to WCAG, which is the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, so I call them WCAG uh, 2.1. And that was more designed to account for the devices that we use to connect to the internet these days, such as iPhones, iPads, smart TVs, and so on. And a key aspect of that is having content reflow to suit different device sizes. And that's what we tend to think of as being responsive. Just a few months ago in February, the first draft of WCAG 2.2 was released. That included improvements to focus indicators. And if you've not thought about focus indicators or you don't know what they are, I'm using a virtual one in my slides here, this yellow box showing you different aspects I'm trying to focus your attention on. And I'll tell you much more about that later. And in a couple of years time, we expect to have the next generation of accessibility guidelines Something that I'm quite interested in there is their plan to add more improvements to allow for more effective automated testing, because testing manually can take an awful lot of time and resource. Those three levels, a bit like batteries, they're A, AA and AAA. A is the minimum level, AA is the recommended level, and that's what, if the, these guidelines are referred to by regulations, they tend to refer to the AA level. And there's also the enhanced AAA level. I mentioned PAW, it's an acronym. Perceivable means that 
uh, it's talking about catering to our senses. So that could be if we're unable to see an image, that alternate text tells us what meaning we should get from it. Operable means we should be able to use the site not only with a mouse, but also with a keyboard or another uh, type of uh, device, maybe an assistive technology. Understandable means readable and predictable. An example of that is when we uh, when we click on um, when we click on a interface component that we can expect the same thing to happen whichever device we're using. So and finally, we have robust, which means that it is compatible with devices across the spectrum, including user agents that might not have been invented yet. And so that's more about making sure that uh, we're using effective coding to regulations, we're cl closing our tags, that kind of thing. And this poor, this perceivable, operable, understandable and robust, as you can see here, is um, how the guidelines are kind of broken down to try to make it easier to understand. In terms of what's relevant to Blackboard in this presentation, we're going to be looking at dealing with color contrast and also focus indicators. So looking at color and contrast, the guidelines provide a way for us to tell when we use two colors together that they, how we can make sure they're as legible to people as possible. And the way that we do that is by determining the relative luminance of two colors and then comparing it. And the result is a contrast ratio. And that is a number. And the lower the number, the worse it is. The higher the number, the better. So as you can see in these examples, uh, the higher the uh, contrast ratio, the more likely we are to be able to distinguish what we're trying to show. You don't have to, um, you don't have to calculate uh, relative luminances yourself. You can use a number of uh, checkers online. My favorite one is whocanuse.com, developed by Corey Ginnivan, who's based in Perth in Australia. This uh, website not only will calculate the contrast ratio for you, it will also show you examples of how that contrast ratio looks, depending on different uh, visual impairments. And there's also automated ways, and I particularly recommend the Microsoft Accessibility Insights browser plugin that allows you to run a fast pass, which covers um, a few simple areas of accessibility and is a great way of getting started assessing how accessible your website is, but it doesn't cover everything. Thinking about those situational impairments, Two that I think might be quite familiar to you are using a screen in a bright light. It could be hard to read uh, what you're trying to see. And also um, something that's very common probably in education is using a projector in a well-lit room. You can't control the, uh, like the windows, the lights, and the projector is not really good. And so the image is not that clear. And the lower the contrast, the worse it will be. And so we want to make sure we're using high contrast to make it as visible as possible, at least as far as the guidelines go. So thinking back, uh, how do you think those examples would look? I don't think those look very good, particularly not if we were enduring any of those situational impairments. And just to put your mind at ease, this is how our Blackboard usually looks. So we're going to get into the nitty gritty now. We're starting with non-text contrast. Now this covers graphical objects such as you see here. It could be a chart, a diagram, a graph, or user interface components such as icons. And so the, regu or the, the guideline states that for non-text contrast, we should have a contrast ratio of at least three to one. How we apply that in Blackboard is a good area to look at is the buttons above the course menu. So this blue is from our color scheme, but it is um, not, it doesn't have high enough contrast, whereas this darker blue does. And throughout the presentation, I'm gonna be just showing you the, the CSS that uh, controls this and I'm not going to be explaining it but just setting your mind if you're thinking I'll never remember all this it's all in the slides it's all on the web page so you can go back to that and hopefully this resource will be useful to many people for some time to come in terms of text so the visual representation of text at double a level the recommended level we should have at least a contrast ratio of 4.5 to 1 and at the enhanced level, we should be aiming to have at least seven to one contrast ratio. 
There are some exceptions, but other than logo types, I don't believe any of these apply in, the, uh, in terms of customizing our theme. So a good example is create announcement. Everyone loves announcements. Uh, the, this uh, green color is not particularly uh, good with white. It has a lower contrast ratio. It's less than 4.5, so that's no good. Whereas this much darker blue is a much higher contrast ratio. That's good enough to meet AAA criteria, and that's what we're using at Southampton. And that is the CSS that produces uh, that setup. So the ratios to remember. Three to one is the minimum for graphical objects, so we use the interface components. 4.5 to one is the minimum level for text, and seven to one is the enhanced level for text. Now, I'm sure many of your institutions will have a institutional brand, a color palette, and this is what our one looks like. And when I was setting up our theme, I found myself checking uh, different combinations of color repeatedly to see, oh, this would look nice, but would it really work? Or is it accessible? And having done, spent a long summer doing that, I decided it wouldn't be much easier to have a lookup table. So I did a bit of uh, investigation and I created a script that would create lookup tables like the one that you see here. And I then found I was using that a lot. So F means we shouldn't use this combination at all. We've got foreground colors along the top, background colors along the side. Uh, G means it's okay for graphics, but not for text. Double A means it's okay for text, and triple A means it's very okay for text. I was showing this to colleagues, and they said, it wouldn't be nice to have a way uh, that we could see what all of these combinations would look like. So I developed my script further, and it produces a set of web pages with examples of all of the different color combina combinations. And since this is a script, you're very welcome to connect with me on LinkedIn. Let me know your HTML colors. I'll run them through the script and I'll send you back the results looking like this so you can use these at your own institution as well. Now I'm going to share with you some complexities, some kind of lessons that I found as I was customizing our theme. We need to account for when we hover over um, menu items and uh, buttons and so on. So here we've got what we see when we're in the content areas. So we need to ensure not only do we have a different color, but also that um, we're meeting the guidelines there as well. Furthermore, we have in the control panel, when we expand an area, that expanded area, in this example, users and groups, changes color. And also when we hover over uh, menu items or in the control panel, that changes as well. So we need to be sure that we're making that those colors are also accessible. And there's the CSS to do that. And there's even more complexity because it's uh, not exactly documented, uh, the Blackboard theme. Uh, I was sometimes surprising myself, oh wow, so this button's also in multiple places. The benefit of, that, of me sharing the theme on the community site is that, as I often say, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants. And I've been standing on the shoulders of many community members over the years. And hopefully now uh, some of you can stand on my shoulders, as it were, as well. And uh, sorry. so what about course menus? So course menus, uh, we reset all of ours uh, when we introduced the new theme. But um, we also wanted to allow instructors to still be able to change the color of their, contra of their course menus. But what do we do if they end up making something like this? Well, I've got some suggestions there, which I didn't really find uh, particularly good. And even if we do not customize our theme, but we do allow instructors to change their color of their menus, then the default hover and focus colors will not contrast very well necessarily. So purple contrasting with white is not good. It's below, it's on a contrast ratio below two to one. So a solution I came up with was, it's kind of a workaround. It's if we hover or focus over a menu item in the Blackboard course menu, that the background changes to white and the text to black. And I'm going to show you a video of how that looks. In this short clip, I demonstrate a workaround for when a Blackboard course menu color scheme lacks sufficient contrast. I've customized the theme so that when a user hovers their mouse pointer over a menu item, 
the background changes to white and the text to black, providing maximum contrast to the menu items. When using an alternative navigation method, such as keyboard navigation, the focus indicator allows us to select interface elements. As such, the background and text of menu items changes in the same way when focused. All right. So I've been sharing this with community members and a colleague, uh, Lillian Soon from the University of York, wrote in a, a forum post um, that she really does not like uh, these default purple colors and was asking Blackboard to fix it because uh, Lillian said that not everyone's as good at bluffing at CSS as I am. And considering I only really started learning CSS uh, a few, well, less than a year ago, really, um, it's uh, it really hit home that not everyone's going to have the time to do this. And so uh, today I'm going to be sharing with you a JS hack package. So if you just would like this workaround, but don't want to have to deal with learning the CSS or how to implement a theme, you can install JS hack upload this package and enable it, and then it will apply that workaround for you. And I'll be writing a post on the Blackboard community site sharing that further uh, as soon as I get a moment. Now, looking at keyboard navigation, the focus indicators, have you noticed how if you tab around a web page, a box might move around the different elements of the page? So we can use keyboard shortcuts to navigate our way around a web page. And keyboard navigation is not only uh, specifically for users of the keyboard, it's used by other assistive technologies. For example, mouse stick, sip and puff. And focus indicators are used by screen readers and power users love keyboard shortcuts. And thinking about those situational impairments, I, I know many of you might well have needed to use a colleague's computer, but they had a trackball or a strange mouse and you just didn't get on with using it. If you can use the keyboard, then you've got a workaround rather than trying to uh, use one of these types of devices. Or you could be using a device one-handed, think of the, the new parent, or if you could be in a cramped space and you've got no room to really use a mouse or even a trackpad. In Blackboard, in the default 2016 theme, this is what the focus indicators look like. And in the guidelines, in WCAG 2.1, they, they're a little bit vague, but once you start digging in, it does start to get more specific. But more importantly, in the draft of WCAG 2.2, the, the main new area of that was much more detail about how we should be using focus indicators. And the main thing to look at there is that we should have at least a three to one contrast ratio. So if we were to change our theme, I mean, if we don't change our theme, the focus indicators out of the box are fine. I've got some examples of them here. But if we do change our theme, then we need to account for the colors of the focus indicators because that purple might not contrast well with your university colors. So here's some examples of my customizations. We've got um, the along the top tabs, uh, the logout button, I also changed the logout button. So rather than that power on and off icon, I wanted a nice big button that people would actually use because I've never seen anyone using uh, the default uh, on and off button for logging in and, or for logging out. And the focus indicator in that case is a big white box to show that, yeah, I'm definitely going to be logging out. We've got to think about the control panel as well. And in general, I've been aiming at trying to make sure that the focus indicators are uh, suitably large and identifiable. And if you do customize your theme, as I've also already kind of mentioned, it is really almost inevitable that we should look at focus indicators because the default colors are not necessarily going to contrast well with the colors that you choose when you customize your theme. So we're reaching the conclusion. So hopefully we'll have a good amount of time to cover any uh, questions. So I would say accessibility is a journey. There's always something new to learn and new developments to understand. And if you're thinking, wow, that was a lot, Matt must really know his stuff. I mean, I'm learning new stuff all the time. And uh, it, there really is an awful lot that I still need to really uh, concentrate to learn uh, and to get a better understanding and, and get to grips with. But I would say that just like the Blackboard community, the accessibility community is fantastic at sharing good practice. And um, in, the, um, in the links in the uh, 
the handout and also in the uh, from the web page at the bottom. I've got some further links under the kind of level of uh, professional development if you're looking to kind of learn a bit more. If you're thinking, Matt, customizing the theme seems like an awful lot of effort. Maybe I just won't bother. There are still many benefits to customizing the theme, not only fixing bugs, but also making certain aspects better. And um, I would definitely recommend having a look at our previous Bluffers Guide to customizing the theme, where we give some examples of that. And also take a look at my blog post. Um, let me show you my blackboard, where I show some of the customizations that I've done based on customizing the theme. In my experience, color contrast and focus indicators are the most important considerations, but there are some more. Uh, I'd recommend, if you're interested in this, take a look at my presentation to the European conference. Link is at the bottom of the slides there, um, where that presentation went on for about one and a half hours, and I go into a lot more detail of different areas of accessibility that we can uh, look at when we're customizing our theme and our Blackboard environment. And hopefully, with the techniques and suggestions that I've shown you here today, you should feel confident at having a go. I really do hope so. So thank you very much. That was the practical Bluffer's Guide to Blackboard Theme Accessibility. And next, I'm going to hand over to Louise uh, to go through any questions. Thank you. Over to you, Louise. Thank you, Matt. And as always, you know, what a great session. Um, everybody who's ever seen one of Matt's presentations before will know um, that you get a lot of content. And yes, he really did get through 147 slides in that 30-minute uh, presentation and also lots of background reading and lots of follow-up. So please do, I do encourage you to, um, to take up on those. Uh, Matt, we do have a few questions. So um, let's start with, with one I have here that said, you know, you speak so well on the subject. Um, and I know that you, as you say, you're learning as you go. Um, but has that been a specific interest for ages around accessibility? Or has the EU Web Accessibility Guidelines prompted your interest in this area? Matt? That is a great question and great to see that Anne was attending as well. So yes, I have to say, ashamedly, I had not paid enough attention to accessibility over the years. And I've looked back at some materials that I've created in the past, and there are some shocking accessibility issues that I'm racing to fix before anyone points them out to me. It was the EU Web Accessibility Guidelines that really prompted me uh, to look at this in detail. Because Blackboard is used by, uh, it's a mission critical service, it's used by all of our staff and students. And when you think about this period of lockdown, the importance of Blackboard has been even greater. I'm sure this would be echoed by other institutions. So I really wanted to make sure not only were we complying with these regulations, but it's the right thing to do, isn't it? And, um, and I'm still learning, but thank you. Hopefully that answers your question. Thank you, Louise. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, I think it, it definitely answers the question. It certainly made the topic much more um, prolific at the moment. Um, I, I'll just add to that just before we go off that theme. Um, do you see a lot of work at the University of Southampton trying to replicate that best practice in the content that the academic staff are producing? Um, I know your focus is on the environment and the navigation, but does your team also promote um, that kind of um, design best practice uh, in the content that the academics are preparing? Yes, um, well, we do try. I've recently joined a team called the Digital Learning Team, and there my colleagues have been doing uh, presentations and webinars about universal design for learning, and also particularly during this period of lockdown, trying to encourage um, the production of accessible materials. But right now it is a bit of a kind of a, a bottom-up exercise where Although we're at this, in the centre, sometimes we feel like a kind of guerrilla organisation trying to talk to people and find out about accessibility and share good practice. Because right now we don't have a top down focus on making sure that uh, our materials are accessible. But I believe that's going to be changing an awful lot. And, and hopefully once these new regulations start to become more forced and once the Office for Students are starting to actually look at how accessible university materials are, I think we'll start to have that extra momentum from the top down as well, which should hopefully then kind of enable 
what the work that we've been doing already to go further. So I'd say yes to some extent, but there's still much further we can go. Uh, we're also getting ally soon, so we'll definitely be starting the conversation with more people about accessibility from there. Thanks, Louise. Thank you, Matt. That makes complete sense. Um, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A um, that I'm going to ask you together, but they may not be questions for you, so please feel free um, to feedback that um, it's not appropriate for you to answer it, and I can get one of the solution engineers or product management um, team to, to address it. So uh, we have a question about what are the options available for the student to customize a theme, um, and then aligned to that, we also have a question about are these tweaks applicable um, to ultra-based navigation, and I know it's early days for you around that, um, but would be interested in your in your point of view. If not, we can get follow-on responses to these um, back to the, the the questioners. Matt, what do you think? Oh, thanks, Louise. So, in terms of allowing students to customise the theme, um, out of the box, there isn't much that we could do there. Within Blackboard, you can enable high contrast features of your operating system. And something that I've been toying with in my mind is creating a, a JS hack where users could kind of select from a number of choices. So you could choose, I would like to use this theme or I'd like to have a dark mode, that kind of thing. I love dark mode. Um, this is something that I would like to have time to look at doing, but I have not yet had time to do. But other than using JS Hack, I'm not aware of a, of a method to allow students to do that. Students that are really into their, their computer stuff, they could use this plugin Stylus to make CSS changes that only affect their own uh, browser. But that's probably going to be more related to students that are kind of like really into their computer stuff and are up for, for doing that kind of thing. For those people that would just like to press a button to choose a, a selection of co colors, then um, it, I think it's something that we could make with JS Hack. And I'll be up for discussing this further with anyone who'd be looking at interested in developing that on the community site. In terms of ultra-based navigation, I'm afraid I, I know that it's not possible with ultra. And I'm not sure whether when you change you the theme with and you have ultra based navigation whether that will work um, maybe one of the solutions engineers could answer uh, that uh, does that cover the question so far louise yes it does and just to be clear we can follow up the questions after the session um, and provide responses directly so there are a couple of other questions matt which are really about access to other resources and materials that you have have shared and we can deal with that and likewise with the ultra question i can get i can ask a solution engineer or a product management team um, person to give them a, a fuller response to that to that query um, so so that's all fine um, I just had one more question for you Matt if you don't mind and that's um, it is a lot of content and you do look expert and I think you are expert even though you're learning as you go um, if you were to promote one of the resources that you, you, you suggested for people that just want to get started where would you direct them to which is the best place to get started um, on this exercise for their own institution? What I would recommend is if you were just starting out, I'm going to put into the chat, there's a lovely website that I really like. So let me just find the chat. I'll just put the link in here. Accessibility with Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay does a kind of a self-paced course where she you can sign up and she'll send you materials kind of each day and over a week. Uh, you can then, she will cover with you uh, numbers of um, kind of the, the big topics in accessibility. So I would recommend uh, having a look at that website, going over the blog. And I can't find the link right now, but I did do a thing where she was sending out emails each day for seven days um, covering different areas of accessibility. So if you just wanted to start out with one uh, site, I really like that one. Thank you, Matt. Um, and it was a little cheeky of me, after all the resources that you've sent, ask you to suggest another one, but I'm really grateful to you. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this session. A huge thanks to Matt, as always, for sharing his experiences and being so generous with his time and his resources and uh, the follow-on materials. Um, I 
encourage you to um, complete the survey that will show up at the end of this session and I hope that you enjoy the rest of Blackboard World. Thank you Matt and thanks to everyone. Have a great day.